physicians in trouble have a hard time asking for help. We always push, take care of the patient, give high quality care. And often we've done that at the detriment of ourselves. I was trained that you didn't show signs of weakness, that you had to be strong all the time. It has to do with the way physicians are trained and it has to do with the way the establishment treats quote unquote impaired physicians. There is a stigma that if individuals like physicians or physician assistants admit that they are struggling or that they have anxiety or feeling depressed, that that may be perceived as a, a weakness. It shouldn't be so hard to find help. It shouldn't be so challenging to figure out what's available. We know that approximately 400 physicians nationwide commit suicide every calendar year. This was before the pandemic. This was before those additional stressors. We're getting into a primary care crisis here in the United States. We know that in 2030, we will have, unless something changes, a primary care crisis. The same thing is happening in other parts of the world. We spoke with hundreds of people about this, and we, we saw a theme pretty quickly. And that was fear. At WebMD and Medscape, one of our most important reports that we publish every year is this burnout report. And I have to say, it's throughout the healthcare system. We focus a lot on doctors, but it's also on nurses, pharmacists, lab technicians. And what's happening is that people are overwhelmed with the workload in, in terms of the number of hours that they have to commit, in terms of the acuity of care and the seriousness of people coming in, the overall volume that never seems to end. So many physicians are just saying, you know what, it's enough. They looked at why physicians aren't seeking the care that they need. And about 50% of physicians thought that they could handle it on their own. And we all know that we can't. We wouldn't tell our patients, eh, you can handle your depression, your stress, your anxiety, your burnout, you can handle it on your own. But we expect ourselves to do it. Now, a lot of this has to do with our training. So 30 years ago, culturally, people really didn't want to address mental illness, let alone seek treatment for any issues. We had a rudimentary understanding of how mental illnesses were neurobiological in nature, and that there is a psychosocial component to it, but that it's really no different than hypertension or diabetes. There's a significant stigma against mental health, so many people are not even talking about the stressors that they're feeling, the burnout that they might be sensing, or even the sense of loneliness or depression that could really lead to poor health outcomes. I would work 120 hours a week as a resident and um, have to be sharp and on it. And I would be asked uh, questions from an attending on rounds. And if you missed it, you were raked over the coals. There's often this bravado right? I, I can do it. Um, I can survive residency. I, I can work 80 hours a week and that's what everyone else does. So I should be able to do it as well. And we ignore the signs of chronic stress, the impact of insomnia and loss of sleep. And we know its relationship to cancer and heart disease. And we talk about it at times to other people, but when it comes to ourselves, we don't recognize it, we don't see it, and the attitude all too often is just push through it. A huge concern that a lot of physicians have is revealing that they have burnout or depression to their state medical board. A lot of states have questions on their renewal for their license or for uh, initially getting their license that deals with mental health. So physicians are put in this conundrum do I say I've had a problem with depression and I've had a problem with burnout and potentially not be licensed or lose their license? Or do they lie and say, hey, you know, I'm having no problems with this at all, things are great, but then they're found out to have sought care 
and said, okay, well, you lied on your license application and you lose your license. So they're in this impossible dilemma. Do I tell the truth and lose my license or do I lie and potentially lose my license if I'm found out? We realized that doctors did not enjoy HIPAA protections like the rest of us. We should have known that they felt that vulnerable because they were that vulnerable. That is really what it comes down to. It's a fear of repercussion. Uh, if you do seek treatment, and that's what happened to uh, to Lorna, uh, and she was deathly afraid that she was going to lose her medical license if she went to seek help, and we all, we all know what happened and how that ended up. My work at the University of Virginia spanned over 20 years, and it really started in the, on the legal side, then it moved into operations where we were looking after really the needs of doctors and nurses who worked for us. And it became increasingly clear over the last five to 10 years that the struggles of our healthcare workforce go, go much beyond what they've been in the past. And so we started working on a lot of these really operational things to make their lives just better on a daily basis. And then uh, my personal and professional life came to this kind of tragic intersection on April 26th of 2020, when my sister-in-law, Dr. Lorna Breen, an emergency medicine physician and director of the New York Presbyterian Allen Hospital in New York City, died by suicide. Lorna had never had any mental health challenges in her life until she contracted COVID in New York City while she was trying to take care of patients. And, and I would say that COVID was incredibly depleting for her. She was very, very sick, but she was also a dedicated health worker. And so the moment she didn't have a fever for 24 hours, she put herself back on the, on the clock, if you will, and ran back into the burning building. Her first day back was April 1st, and she immediately started to express to us her concerns that she couldn't keep up and that somebody, one of her peers or colleagues, might see that and view it as a sign of weakness. And so we told her that she was really, really not well and she should go home, but she didn't go home because that's what doctors are trained to do. They're trained to run back into the fire. And so she pushed on for 12, 15, 18 hour days, 10 in a row, until such point as she just completely broke and we had to evacuate her out of Manhattan urgently. Um, this was right in the middle of the pandemic, so we needed to use a whole group of friends and friends and, and colleagues of hers to literally extract her from Manhattan Then drove her straight to the University of Virginia's emergency room, where she then was admitted to the inpatient psychiatric unit and spent about 10 days. It was the first mental health treatment of her life. And Almost immediately upon receiving that treatment, she started to then articulate to us that now that she had received care, it was gonna impact her license and her career, and she would probably lose her ability to be a doctor. And so that fear, we believe, is one of the primary contributors to her decision then just a few days after being discharged from the hospital that she decided to take her life. Within 12 hours of her death, a major New York newspaper published her cause of death over the family's objection. And what that did was it just opened a floodgate of feedback to our family. And some of the people were coming at us and all of a sudden sharing with us this stigma, this fear of repercussions, these licensure questions, these credentialing questions, all of these barriers to mental health access that apply to doctors and nurses and not to the general population. And so we had, uh, a number of individuals reach out to us after they read that initial publicity, including United States Senator Tim Kaine, who's our junior senator from Virginia, and he asked how he could help. And that started the conversation, which then ultimately turned into the first ever federal law focusing on the well-being of the healthcare workforce called the Dr. Lorna Breen Healthcare Provider Protection Act. I'm encouraged by the steps we've taken over the last three years to support our healthcare healers including the passage of the Dr. Lorna Breen Healthcare Provider Protection Act that provided a much needed investment in the mental health and well-being of our healers and frontline workers. But we know that was only a first step. Uh, 
The times are challenging. The last few years have put such stress on people's shoulders, so much more has to be done to address mental health among our health care providers. That's why the Safe Haven program is so important. We set out at trying to figure out how to get them enough protection to let them open up and get the help that they needed, particularly earlier in the cycle, so that we could prevent the deep level of distress from being reached before they had substance abuse or were ready to do harm to themselves or, or others. And we set about working with the Department of Health Professionals, the Board of Medicine, with the Virginia trial lawyers to figure out what was the right balance there to protect patients and provide this form of safety for people. And we had great partnership and crafted legislation in the fall of 2019, and we introduced it as an emergency resolution in January of 2020. It passed unanimously through both houses, and the governor at the time, Governor Ralph Northam, signed it into to law in March of 2020, right as the pandemic broke open. One of the things that we've been able to identify are six barriers to mental health access that apply uniquely to the healthcare workforce. And one of those barriers is right exactly what the Safe Haven program is targeting, which is really the confidentiality of the mental health medical records of our healthcare workforce. Physicians, PAs, nurses, pharmacists, others needed to know that they were protected. And in the legislation, we specifically carved out protections that if you took part in the Safe Haven program, you were legally protected from any conversation being discoverable, no matter the type of lawsuit. Your employer didn't know or need to know, wasn't shareable with them. And frankly, it wasn't reportable to the Board of Medicine unless you were about to do harm to yourself or to others. And in those ways, we simplified it and created this pocket of protection where people could get help and still be responsible to patients. It's hard to ask for help. Somebody uh, asked me how many days had I ever missed from work from illness? And the answer to that's zero. I'm in my mid fifties. I've been lucky to be sure, but you, but it's hard to to feel like you can't do it. But yet it's okay. You know, Safe Haven is a, another place that it's okay. It's in a safe space where you can talk to somebody and share in a way that's not going to come back in a regulatory or legal way because it's protected in the state of Virginia. For physicians, the programs that we have out there sometimes are used. We have employee assistance programs and other programs, but oftentimes physicians don't want to go to those programs. With Safe Haven, there's been a big difference. And because people understand that they can talk to somebody and it's privileged information, they actually are talking. And it's like 10 times the use rate of our other programs. So for that, just with that in and of itself, that has been a tremendous improvement in how physicians can help take care of ourselves. It truly is giving back some of that control that then allows your prefrontal cortex to work better to the individual provider. Our students and kind of that next generation are using programs like Safe Haven because they are acknowledging that they are stressed and that the pandemic has, you know, put a lot more pressure on them mentally. They're of a generation where they're not shy to admit that they're feeling lonely or that they're feeling anxious or they're feeling depressed. And they're not shy to reach out for help. Physicians are human too. And, and so having a resource, you know, where we can reach out, we can get help is so important. You know, I, for so long, mental health has had a stigma uh, for patients, for doctors, for everyone. And so it's so important that as we focus on mental health, that we recognize that it's okay not to feel great, but it is not okay to stay that way. I've been in my community for 20 years, and so I'm fortunate that I have four generations of patients in my practice. So I get to see babies to people that are 103 and I love it. During COVID, uh, there was a spell where I started to really struggle personally. As kind of there was this movement to distrust science, there was a movement to distrust physicians. 
And so for the first time, my physician, my patients were um, questioning me, sometimes arguing with me, um, and occasionally becoming kind of belligerent. And that was really difficult. I lost three patients in a week to COVID. And um, the first two patients were a husband and wife that um, I can still right now remember where we sat in my exam room talking about vaccination and how important it was for them because they were in their 70s and both diabetic and both very high risk. And they said they didn't need the vaccine because they never left their home while they were in my office. So I said, you do leave your home, you, you need to get vaccinated. But they didn't want to get vaccinated. And the husband died five days after his wife in the hospital on her birthday. And so I started recognizing some signs in myself of burnout. I was starting to have trouble sleeping. I was waking up in the morning and having thoughts like, I really don't want to deal with this today. I'm just kind of tired of arguing with people and just having people not trust me for the first time in my medical career. So I called Safe Haven. The people on the other end are master's level folks to talk to you and kind of told her what I was struggling with. And she immediately made me feel better because she said, I've heard this story so many times every day. Uh, you're not alone in this. And that just made me feel better right away because you do feel very isolated. I had a Zoom meeting with a psychiatrist in Atlanta, uh, which was great. Um, he was wonderful, he was very funny, he gave me a lot of resources and uh, a lot of really good ideas. So my personal experience with Safe Haven was um, really fantastic. Safe Haven is one of the most innovative programs I've ever heard of. Physicians need help. And it's so important that programs like Safe Haven exist. Otherwise, we know that suicidality, sadness, depression, anxiety, all of those things are increasing in the physician's face. In order for us to have physicians to take care of the next generation, we need to have programs like Safe Haven. It's vitally important that we get Safe Haven in all 50 states. I think it's made a significant difference for physicians because they finally feel safe and seeking help. The utilization rates are, are strong and growing. We know the program is spreading across the country. We've already seen that start. We need more states. We know solutions are found at the local level and we need people in each state to come with us. Bring your problems, bring your challenges. Let's work on them together and let's get the funders and the champions to the table with us and break down some of these walls. We've proved already that we can make a difference. Let's keep going. Join us. Let's make this a national movement. You can't have an efficient healthcare system if you don't have a workforce that feels good about themselves, that is competent, that has physical health and mental health. This idea that you can manage it all on your own, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. We've all heard that at some point in our life. And there really needs to be this acknowledgement that that's not the way. It's okay to say you're not okay. We should encourage people to seek help and truly do it, not as lip service. That's what it's been in the past. Now we really have to make those efforts, have those programs such as Safe Haven, but at the same time, find our own safe haven, whether it's time with family, whether it's reading a book, watching a movie, seeking professional help, whatever that might be, I would encourage everyone to find their safe haven.